fact that there were literally millions of people in Ireland then, their potato crops had failed. Potato was their, virtually their only source of food. They had nothing else to eat at all. They were literally starving. In fact, they were dying of starvation, a lot of them, as well as dying of diseases caused through their diet at that time. And this famine continued for at least four years with one crop after another failing. So I ask you, what would any normal person do if he was starving, if he knew he was responsible for his younger brothers and sisters? He had to do something to feed them. He did what I think the average person would do. He saw the sheep around somewhere that um, probably wasn't uh, under care of anyone and decided, well, this is good enough for me. I'll, I'll grab it and kill it and uh, at least provide some food for the time being for my, for my, my brothers and sisters. In the reign of Elizabeth I of England, an Act of Parliament was passed that empowered the Privy Council to banish rogues, vagabonds and sturdy beggars beyond the seas. And so the seed was sown for the most extended transplanting of people ever known to man. The sending of errant Englishmen across the oceans of the world would last for 260 years, and in that time, Thousands of men, women and children would become exiles, banished forever from the shores of England. My great-grandfather was a convict. He um, was convicted of sheep stealing in Ireland in uh, 1849. He was the eldest uh, son of a family of several children. I'm not at all ashamed of the fact that he was a convict. In fact, I'm Quite, quite proud of it. I think it's something to be the descendant of a convict in Australia today. Nine years after Elizabeth's Parliament had passed that act, a royal charter was granted to a company of gentlemen. It was a charter which allowed a band of English adventurers to form a colony on the eastern coast of America. Virginia and the tobacco plantations of the New World would be the first to receive those who had broken the laws of England. For even then the English were saying, our land has grown weary of its people. As I just look around me here and think about him and um, how he came here, 16 year old and convicted of robbery with violence and really ostracized from his family and um, the town people. Eventually, the American colonies would become weary of England. The War of Independence would effectively close the American market for English convicts. The prisons of England spilt over with the unfortunate, the dishonest, the unlucky and the unscrupulous. And as the prisons choked with this humanity, the overflow was crammed into prison hulks. Unseaworthy ships moored in the Thames, floating hell holes. I think one feels very, very proud to have a convict for a great grandfather. From the information we have available about him, a very deep affection for the man and I think perhaps one could probably sum up his character as a affectionate scallywag. And when these burst, the final stage, the final solution. Transportation to the penal settlement of New South Wales. A tradition that had started in the reign of the first Elizabeth and would end in the reign of Victoria. To this place would be sent shiploads of the unwanted, 
the unfortunates, the children that stole a loaf of bread, or the husbands that poached a rabbit. The problem of her criminals continued to haunt the British government. The colonial office in New South Wales had advised London that convicts would be no longer welcome. In Sydney it was reported that the governor threatened to sink any convict ship that arrived in port. And there was also tension 600 miles to the south in Hobart and Port Arthur. In fact no one wanted convicts at all. To make Port Arthur a place of severe and dreaded secondary punishment, I submitted that a penitentiary should be built to hold 300 men. I firmly believe that nothing except the walls of separate compartments will keep them from being so troublesome. Great care has been taken to prevent unnatural crimes among the convicts, yet it was extremely difficult to maintain complete surveillance. The effect of confinement was quite remarkable, and in a very short time they ceased to be any trouble at all. They became quiet and orderly. By 1846, nearly 30,000 British convicts were languishing in Tasmania, and of these, a quarter were unemployed. The British government was forced to stop further shipments until a solution was found. And that solution arrived in the form of a request from the Swan River Colony, they wanted a penal establishment. Rogues, vagabonds, beggars, convicts. Gentlemen, Frederick. Cheap continual labour, and that can be best supplied by convicts, and have them working away from any settled districts where they'll neither escape nor corrupt others. When they have their freedom, transfer them to some other unoccupied place but all the time shifting them away from the amenities of social life. Where they labour, they'll die. The only sign that they've even lived will be the structures that they raise in that wild bush. He's right. Now look at this poor, miserable town of Perth. Should it be so except for the want of cheap labour? What we want is cheap labour. Mm. But let me add, I oppose the introduction of female convicts. I wish to protect my family. Male prisoners you can employ outdoors, but females would want to work in the home. One female convict is sufficient to corrupt 50 males. Gentlemen, gentlemen. I've been told from good authority that the majority of convict women are the greatest drunkards, and they never marry. Yeah, yeah. bold Ash. Many, many convicts are far more moral than most of you here. Many have clashed with the law for stealing perhaps a, a loaf of bread or something to save a dying wife or child. Some have even been convicted of killing a bird. That's the property of all men. You go on and you moralize about our youth in the colony uh, becoming thieves. <laughs> That's a laugh. They wouldn't make enough in that profession here even to stay alive. Please, please. Gentlemen, please. gentlemen. Yeah. It is the opinion of the York farmers that we should send a petition to the home government in London. We should tell them that without convict labour, without making this appealing settlement, this colony can never prosper. Well, I'm not too sure. It was an incredible request. The colony of the Swan River had attracted many people in its first year. Some had been attracted by its romantic name, others by the false reports of rich soil, but many were impressed by the government regulation of 1829 that stated, it is not intended that convicts or other description of prisoner be transported to the new settlement. This was to be a free settlement, free from the taint that surrounded the colonies of the East Coast. New South Wales and Tasmania could have their penal establishments, but here in the West, it would be different. 
And of course, if the settlers had found the land rich and the soil bountiful, this would have been true. As things in the colony grew worse, various ideas and schemes were considered. One official suggested Chinese coolies be introduced from Singapore as cheap labour. But the best solution was seen in the introduction of English convicts. A public meeting in February 1849 took the final step. An agreement was worked out with these general conditions. One, all convicts were to be able-bodied men under 45 years of age. Two, all to have only half their sentence left to serve. Three, no prisoners from Irish jails. Four, no female prisoners. Five, and no prisoners of a dangerous and reckless class. <clears throat> the terms are really quite clear. The colonials were not afraid to show their prejudice and also their callousness. No females were to be allowed because the colonists felt that should a male and female convict marry, the mixing of two bad bloods would produce criminal offsprings. No, it won't work. They also wanted that half the sentence should have been served in England. This allowed a quicker release of labour for the colony. It has been ordained since the beginning of the world that there should be different denominations and classes of people. It has been ordained since the beginning that there should be masters and servants. It won't work. There's a curse attending this place. <laughs> Everything goes against it. It's no use trying to get on. If anything does turn up, the government cramps you. <laughs> They're all fools and imbeciles. Mr. Burgess, I was opposed to the convicts coming. I've changed my mind. Now I see our need, I agree. The convicts should be sent. Dear Father, I am writing these few lines, trusting that they will find you, and all who are dear to me, well. Imagine my surprise when it was intimated to me that I was to be sent out to the colony of Western Australia. I assure you, poor Father, that I never felt more annoyed in my life. The mermaid is a fine-looking, copper-bottomed bark of about 600 tons. There are 200 prisoners aboard. We sleep four together, segregated by a 10-inch board. Our rations consist of breakfast, 10 and a half ounces of biscuits and a pint of gruel, dinner, eight ounces of salt meat and a pint of thin broth, supper, one pot of tea or chocolate. Smoking is strictly forbidden. All quarrelling is severely punished. We are told that our conduct during this voyage will very much influence our future prospects in the colony. <laughs> what prospects? The 21st anniversary of poor, worthless Western Australia. Half my life gone, lost. Never to return. The only experience you learn here is hardship, slander, and disgusting jealousy. A ship arrived today with 76 convicts under Captain Henderson. I only hope a new colony is in the making.
You got that? Dearest father, I have arrived in the land of my exile. The mermaid's voyage was uneventful. We were the third ship to arrive at Fremantle, and now I find myself at work under the control of General Captain Henderson at the site of the new prison. 30 feet, uh, 15 degrees. After landing, Rock. all of us were advertised in the colonial newspaper, informing the settlers of our availability and the trades that we follow. 29 farm laborers, four gentlemen servants, three painters, two shoemakers, one armorer. He'll be useful. Father, you'll be pleased to know I've been picked by Mr. Shenton. I'll enter his service when my time's up. Now I have to take those measurements again, Roth. I'm not quite certain of it at that angle. Yes. Make it 30 feet at a 15 degree angle. Get those posts in a line along there. Three or four of them. You got that, have you? The prejudice on the part of the settlers against the prisoners has generally disappeared. You can have little idea of the opposition because of fear and mistrust from the governor down, with which I've had to put up with in bringing this system into play. I've established depots in various country towns for the men to go on a ticket of leave. I would also like to see the convicts getting a decent rate of pay for their work. As for the colony itself, it's doing well, prospering in a quiet sort of way, without doing anything brilliant. The request for convicts had gone out in a petition from 200 colonists who saw in the introduction of convicts a source of cheap labour. A ready pool of workers for the farming areas, like the new town of York here in the Avon Valley. What they needed most were labourers and simple shepherds to watch their flocks. Many of these farmers still clung to the dream of becoming English squires on their vast land holdings. They were not at all keen to pay high wages. Ah, good morning, Henry. Any letters? Morning. Just the usual. Dixon wants some pigeon holes sent over to Tuja. Oh, my God. What else do the aristocrats want today? Sunbird just wants a convict party to uh, build a road to his property. Hmm. How long is the road to be? 18 miles. What? 18 miles. Oh, I'm not buying into that. Tell old Beeswax to sort that out. I'll forward it on to His Excellency. Anything else? Some requests from Ticket of Leavers for permission to get married. Who are they from? Any bigamists to be? Yes, one. J. Hadley, 1172. Our records show he's been married in England. Ah. Uh. Roth, take a letter, will you? Address it to 1172. Ah, uh, with regard to your letter for permission to marry, I have the honour to inform you that no such permission can be granted as the records show in the convict register that you are already married in England, etc., etc. Break those rocks! My beloved son, it is not likely I will ever hear you speak again. But if I do, it will be the proudest day of my life. I freely forgive you all the sleepless nights you have caused me, and I truly hope that God will forgive you too. Dearest son, be sober, be steady, and above all, be virtuous. Captain Edmund Henderson was going to build a fine imperial prison for his men. And what a house of convicts it would be. His first plan was a beauty. The site selected within half a mile of the seashore and upon the rising ground immediately in rear of Fremantle is in every way admirably adapted for the purpose as regards salubrity, facility for drainage, supply of water and isolation. Hi, 
The estimated cost, including outbuildings and walls, was twenty-seven thousand two hundred and seventy pounds, three shillings and one penny. Henderson submitted it to the governor, who sent it off to London. The reaction was immediate. Nobody had made any allowance to house convicts. Weren't they going to be, well, uh, absorbed into the community or, or something? Twenty-seven thousand two hundred and seventy pounds, three shillings and one penny? Western where? Western Australia? Poor Captain Henderson. He didn't get his twenty-seven thousand two hundred and seventy pounds. Instead, he was told to modify his plans, for after all, the colony had been founded in 1829 on the sum of one thousand pounds. New plans were drawn at an estimated cost of six thousand nine hundred and seventy-nine pounds. The convicts quarried into the side of Fremantle Hill to level the site. As the stone was removed, it was cut into blocks for the walls. Lime for mortar was burnt locally, and heavy Swan River mahogany supplied from local saw pits. It was to be the largest building in the colony. What could not be obtained locally was shipped out from England. Five hundred and thirty-eight iron doors. Two thousand six hundred and twenty-five pounds of flooring nails, one thousand two hundred and twenty-eight pairs of iron hinges, and three thousand four hundred pounds of putty. These iron rails and fittings were used to secure prisoners on board the convict ships, and when the ships arrived, the iron work was simply unbolted and taken ashore. But problems arose, and delays were considerable. In 1855, Henderson reported, The removal of the prisoners from the old hired buildings, which were low and surrounded by swamp, to the airy and well-ventilated new prison is most beneficial in every way, both as regards discipline and health. York, Western Australia. Dearest Father, since the date of my last letter, I have been removed to York District. I find it more conducive to my health, having experienced a fever during the last few months of my stay at Fremantle. My occupation has again likewise changed. I am clerk to the hiring depot. I have all the responsibility upon myself for keeping correct accounts required by the home government in this colony. You would laugh if you were to see me sometimes making out returns of work. I receive one shilling and sixpence a day, seven days in each week, and in all probability will receive a higher rate when my conditional pardon is received in January next. Then I am ranked a free man. Your loving son, John Roth. An awesome desert separated Western Australia from the East Coast. Most ships bypassed it, most people ignored it. It was one of the forgotten corners of the British Empire, a corner that had sprung to life with a dream and nearly died when the dream was broken. Nearly 10,000 convicts were to come to this place between 1850 and 1868. And of those 10,000, only a few would escape. And they were recaptured quickly, for where were they to go? It was the remotest penal establishment in the world. The convict system in this colony has been running for ten years now, and I must say, for my part, it is going well. We have here several different sets of leg irons, ranging from 14 to 28 pounds, and of course the cat o' nine tails, in both leather and cotton, but these are seldom used. When they are, the prisoner wears a special corset of leather to protect the kidneys during the flogging. Although I feel that flogging does more harm than good. As for putting a man in chains, it is useless and aggravating.
There is now much questioning of the convict system of transportation. We here are now the last place in the world to which they are sent. The other Australian colonies in the East are complaining to London, demanding the stopping of all further shipments. They are saying our pardoned men are invading their settlements. There is also much agitation in England. During my last period of leave there, five years ago, I gave evidence to the House of Lords inquiry. Now, at this very moment, the House of Commons is holding another inquiry. Mr. Burtish, you have been for some years in Western Australia as a settler. Since 1829, I was one of the first settlers. You employ convicts yourself? I do. Do you employ a considerable number? Yes. I can't tell the number exactly. I have about 60 servants in my employment. About half of them are or have been convicts. Are you a sheep farmer? Yes. And a horse breeder. And a mine owner? Yes. Have you been a squatter from the beginning of the colony? Not exactly a squatter. It was I and Mr. Gregory who discovered the new country in Champion Bay. Mr. Burgess, had an expectation of benefit from the introduction of convicts anything to do with your taking up the new country? Of course I expected benefit. It gave me greater facilities for obtaining servants. When a convict gets his pardon, has he a tendency to leave the colony as a free man? Some have, some haven't. Yes. I've had several which I've given farms to. Ah, oh, you mean that you have purchased land for them? Yes. I've bought land and given them teams. Charged them interest for the money, of course. Mr. Sam Burgess, are you the brother of the last witness? I am. You've heard your brother's evidence? Yes. You have very valuable mines in the colony. They give an average of 30% copper. The mines are worked by convict labour. Chiefly by convict labour. The mines are all in my district, and I am the resident magistrate. What's the control an employer has over a ticket of leave man that he hasn't got over a free man? There's no extra control, except that he may make complaints before a magistrate. And you're the magistrate? Yes. Sir, the whole object of transportation to Western Australia was that a man should occupy a better position, not to be converted into a slave. Now's the time, mate. Go. Good luck, mate. Wealthy colonists at this time succeeded in bringing about 10,000 labouring men to Western Australia but it was estimated at the time that they probably only needed 40 or 50 good labourers. They used up those men during the period of their ticket of leave when they had to pay them relatively little and after that virtually abandoned them to their fate. There was a, a conflict um, of views of transportation between the settlers and the British back home. That the colonists are only interested in the, in the convicts while they are convicts and while they're ticket of leave men. Once they're free men with a conditional pardon, they really don't want to know about them. They're not interested in them as permanent inhabitants of the colony and they really would rather they left. Ah, uh, Mr. Rowe, I read in one of Captain Henderson's reports uh, that in the year previous, 150 conditional pardon men went from Western Australia to Adelaide, South Australia. Very likely. Then you're willing to take convicts, but you make it a condition that after a certain time, those convicts should be at liberty to go away, and in effect, that they should go away. No, not at all. Isn't that somewhat inconsistent? On the one hand, you request to receive a certain amount of convict labour to the colony, and then, on the other hand, you object to it being there because it might overstock the market. We're not anxious to keep all of the has-been convict labour. We've stipulated, as a condition of having convicts here, that there be an equal amount of free emigration. Why? To neutralise the effect of so many convicts. 
You say you object to conditional pardon men being kept in the colony because it tends to uh, overstock the labour market. But you are waiting for them to get their pardon, then encouraging them to leave the colony. What you are now doing is that you are pumping in 300 men at one end and getting rid of 300 at the other. But, sir, you say that the settler makes no difference between the two classes. Then why go through all this expensive process when one 300 is as good as the other 300? Isn't uh, convict labour now employed in building two government houses? One at Perth and the other at Rottnest Island. Um, houses for the governor. Yes. Do you think it's very undesirable to send out a parcel of lunatics? More than the usual number of prisoners are dying of tuberculosis. Every fresh prison ship brings out many and more or less the same advanced stage. They will all eventually die in this place. Two prisoners have just committed suicide. They were both in solitary confinement. I have seven prisoners under treatment for mental disorders. Another four I've sent to the asylum. I think we have to recognise that the convict period poses a moral question which was never faced adequately at the time and which we in modern society still find ourselves unable to come to terms with. In fact, one historian argued 20 years ago that the convicts never needed to be brought to Western Australia at all, that the children of the labouring classes were just about coming of age and entering the workforce anyway and could easily have supplied the labour that the York colonists said they needed. This is the sort of country outside of York where the, the York farmers originally wanted the convicts to work clearing the land, uh, making the roads, tending the sheep. Life for the convicts would have been hard work and often extremely lonely shepherding life out in the bush. Henderson's term as Controller General had been noted for its humanity. He left the colony after 11 years' service to become Britain's Chairman of Directors and Surveyor General of His Majesty's Prisons. He had been firm, but not severe. He did not believe in the practice of flogging and thought that putting men in chains was useless and aggravating. My term here as Controller General is coming to a close. So is that of the Governor, Mr. Kennedy. Last week we toured the country towns. As usual, we were received well. At York, we were escorted into the town by a mob of puss-proud aristocrats. They entertained us at the York racetrack. The races there would have cured anyone of a fancy of horses. <laughs> The new governor arrived today. I showed him around the port. Mrs. Hampton won't break any hearts. As for Hampton, he thinks himself every inch a governor. Why is he in confinement without chains? It is modified punishment, Your Excellency. The prisoner has a double rupture from serving a long time in chains. Oh, really? I think that there are several aspects we need to consider when we're looking at this period. The first is that Hampton's side of the story is, is one aspect, perhaps the official aspect. The other, and I think probably more important, is to remember that 
the vast majority of convicts at this time were actually employed by farmers in the bush, um, by private persons in town, that a large number of them were employed by a small class of privileged men who monopolised both wealth and power at the Swan River Colony and who were able to manipulate the legal system and the press to a large extent to ensure that their views predominated. At this time they controlled the lives of convicts through the law and I think there is evidence to show that they used the law to suit themselves. The prison system was much more violent under Hampton. A ruthless man, principled man if you like, who, who knows what he's doing and is determined to keep the, the prisoners uh, who he sees as being brutal criminals in their place and he does this with absolute rigour. Regulations were enforced. Punishment was inflicted. During his six years in office, the number of attempted escapes trebled. <coughs> also during that period, 96 convicts were tied to the triangles and flogged. Between them, these 96 men received 6,559 lashes of the cat o' nine tails. For the convicts themselves, it was a, a brutalising experience under Hampton's regime. Punishments were, were cruel, not just floggings, but imprisonment in dark cells on bread and water, in chains for indeterminate lengths of time. What happens to people in those sort of um, indeterminate sentences in, in a dark cell deprived of exercise and, and reasonable water and uh, is just mind-boggling. One wants to know how many of these men finished up mad, um, attempting suicide or going berserk. What is certainly true is that the convict element pervades in the colony of Western Australia. If you dine out, the probability is that the man who waits upon your table was a convict. Many thriving shopkeepers here came out as convicts. There are even convict editors of newspapers. A thorough knowledge of the social life of the colony is needed in order to distinguish the free settler from him who was sent out to work a period of punishment. Men who never were convicts come under suspicion of having been so. Men who were convicts are striving to escape from the knowledge. In this respect, a great evil has been done. There are many in the colony now who express much regret that the settlement should ever have been contaminated by a criminal class. Now, when the sweat of the system has been used and the men's bodies are no longer an advantage, they are forgotten. The Bill Sykes features of a large proportion of the population is to be seen daily throughout Western Australia. The roads and buildings are also to be seen. But the colonials remember from whence Bill Sykes came and why, but they forget how they got their roads and bridges. When leaving the colony, I was handed a certificate by the police as I embarked for England. The bearer, Anthony Trollope, was not and never had been a prisoner of the Crown in the colony of Western Australia. Well, he came as a ticket of leave man and married a 17-year-old Irish girl. He then built this cottage from the local material with his own hands, in which to bring his young bride, obviously, and reared his older children here, at the same time working around the area on this property and, uh, and I think other nearby farms, with the um, hope of, of um, building up some degree of finance to enable him to establish himself more permanently elsewhere. And you can see by the general design of the cottage that he 
followed the pattern of building used in his, in his home country of Ireland. I'd say that even the, the general scenery around here at the right time of the year wouldn't be unlike what he'd been used to back home. Amiable arrived on the Lord Raglan and the cargo was listed as convicts. He stole or was charged with having stolen a variety of clothing and other garments from a drapery store on Guernsey Island over a 16 months period. And the items included handkerchiefs, scarves, mahogany needle box. He was eventually found guilty and charged for these offences and given a 10 year transportation sentence. Well, it's a long way from the Channel Islands to York in Western Australia. And I think that, well, little did the Frenchman realise when he left France at the age of 16, that he would be handpicked by Her Majesty's government to represent the new colony in Western Australia and come and settle and eventually die in York right here. There aren't very many letters um, or diaries of convicts. Obviously, they're not likely to be the people who are going to keep diaries or write letters. But the, the ones that do exist, um, maybe they're untypical, but they're absolutely heart-rending on the whole. Um, letters that spring to mind immediately of a man in a, in a hotel room in Guildford um, writing as a ticket of leave man to his wife and family in England. Desperately lonely letters because he hasn't heard from her and he doesn't know what's happened to them and he doesn't know why she's let him down. And he he writes that he's he's got his violin and, and he needs his sheet music and he wants to know how their little girl is and he's agonising over why his wife hasn't written to him. And this man seems to spend the rest of his life as a, an unskilled labourer around Guildford and just dies never seeing his family again. <laughs> 